This is obviously a weekly charting analysis webinar. My name is Jasper Lawler. I've got the risk warning on the screen that we have to go through just for compliance purposes before we kick off our webinar. Okay, there we are. <clears throat> so, in all honesty, a little bit of a quiet day uh, kicking off the week. It's obviously a shortened week. We've got Good Friday <clears throat> on Friday, and uh, that's celebrated not just by us, but by US markets as well. And so, <clears throat> that in combination with uh, almost deliberately slower economic calendar in the lead up, it's going to Maybe, maybe take some of the volatility out of um, FX markets. I noted on Twitter that um, you know, already volume, uh, volatility started to come out of the FX market. Um, you know, very easy to track. Just euro dollar as the main benchmark there, and um, the uh, the true range for the euro dollar um, was about 60% of its um, of its average true range over the last 14 days. <coughs> Uh, so you can see that it's um, starting to contract a bit, and that that's, I think, even more extreme today. We're not seeing too much movement. The only one, notably, is the pound, which isn't too dramatic. Definitely one of the bigger laggards today. Um, after that news about Ian Duncan Smith <coughs> um, quit, you know, quitting the um, front bench of the Tory party after the uh, the budget. And so that normally doesn't matter, that kind of thing, a bit of sort of internal party politics. Uh, but obviously we've got the referendum coming up and, um, you know, the government is in favour of staying. <clears throat> so uh, Ian Duncan Smith is one of the, the MPs who favours exiting. So it um, <clears throat> obviously, yeah, I would say it slightly damages the Remain campaign modestly. And, uh, and so that's where you've seen the pound come off a bit. We'll come back and talk about the pound in more detail, but I think maybe worth just um, having a little look back on what happened last week in terms of its impact on equity markets. The most interesting by far, uh, not today so much, looking like a pretty flat open in U.S. markets, but um, overall, you know, this is our daily chart for the U.S. CSE, our proxy for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Pulled out a little bit, maybe more than I would normally do it. Zoomed out a bit, just because of this uh, declining trend line. That's 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 uh, the the all-time high, and it's connected these two peaks quite well um, from November. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, as you can see. Had a pretty much vertical rally off the February low, and we're just running into this trend line now. So, just a little, I'm not necessarily saying this trend line will <coughs> cap the advance, but I think it's pretty hard to dispute that this, this rally is pretty overextended at this point. Now, um, you can remain above. Um, over, you know, in overbought territory on the RSI and other indicators for a long period of time when the trend is in place. So never would I advocate just selling out of your long position or, or going short just because we're above 70 on the RSI or anything like that. But, uh, you know, we do have this trend line resistance, and then even if we get through the trend line, which I think is probably quite probable, um, we, have, we have some of these peaks beginning at this, um, this December 28th, uh, 29th area, and then back up to the uh, the November peaks, um, pretty much at that 18,000 mark. <clears throat> so um, interestingly, I'm sure you probably read in the, you know, online or in the papers, but um, up and around this vicinity, not far, uh, you know, around sort of 17, 500 to 600 mark on the on the Dow Jones takes the index back into positive territory for the year, and you can kind of pretty much see that according to our charts. You know, this is we were talking about these peaks from December. And then when we look at the 1st of January, um, it, you know, the, the 4th of January, the first opening trade, you know, it's down here somewhere. So, um, you know, we're obviously above that at the moment. So quite, quite the abrupt turnaround. A really nice classic double bottom pattern. The uh, objective for the double bottom was about 17.15. I don't know, you can probably note, oh, 17.505. Um, so nice, um, 
nicely reached. We got a little pause in that area, I think, uh, but barely. And uh, we've just popped high for the next day and stalled a little bit today, but mostly because of the lower trading volume more than any real um, <clears throat> attempt at a sell-off. So um, I don't know if you if you've read my. Um, what is normally Michael's morning report, but um, I wrote it today, um, just referencing the importance of the US dollar. So I'll close down the US 30 for a second. <clears throat> um, but one thing for why it's important for US stocks, the, the rally in stocks began before the dollar started losing value. So the two are not completely in sync, and it does, the dollar doesn't completely explain everything, but I think it's added a bit of extra strength to the rebound which could have just been a dead cat bounce off the lows and, and seen us swiftly drop into to lower lows. But I think the reason, part of the reason that didn't happen is that the weaker dollar um, <coughs> did a couple of things. Well, it did, I would say, three important things. <coughs> One is that it um, added support to the bounce in oil because obviously it was denominated in dollars. Two, um, it improves the prospect for, for U.S. company earnings. And you can see that's partly why U.S. stocks are doing so much better than um, European stocks. I mean, there's a bit of fundamentally, uh, you know, by higher profits being made by, by U.S. companies in general. But still, the multinationals have suffered a bit from the, um, from the stronger dollar because obviously their foreign earnings, they try and repatriate it back to the U.S. And... Um, <clears throat> Don't earn as much from it, um, so so now um, the, the, you know that that's going to be a boost to the the bottom line of, of the multinationals like Apple, who obviously were they've got their product launched today. That, that's probably the biggest event of today, given the lack of uh, economic data. Um, that's about 6 p.m. GMT when Apple, um, I think, are going to be launching a, a smaller, cheaper iPhone, and we'll have to see how markets um, react if that is the case. But those, those kinds of companies are likely to do better. And then the other big concern at the start of the year was the uh, the Chinese yuan, and um, because the dollar has lost some value, the Chinese yuan's pegged against the dollar. The, the um, People's Bank of China haven't had to um, haven't had to depreciate the yuan against the dollar as much, which was a, a big worry that that was a, um, a policy goal of theirs to, to boost Chinese exports. Um, <clears throat> And so that was confirmed again today by the uh, the premier in China, and I think that's part of the reasons why the uh, the German DAX uh, was leading gains, just kind of sagging back a bit now, but um, why we saw a bit of a, a big leg higher. But uh, this is obviously the dollar index, and you can see we've um, really come down a fair bit from the peak, and we just had a bit of a bounce on Friday, and um, seeing a bit more gains today, but not not too much. Uh, like I said, low volatility. Now we've looked at U.S. markets. Um, <clears throat> You know, this is the, the FTSE 100, or our proxy for it at least. You can see we're just, um, you know, compared to the U.S. market, which are now well above their 200-day moving average, and um, sort of, uh, you know, you could probably say something equivalent to sort of 6800 or something um, if the FTSE 100 were to be matching the Dow Jones. It would be way up here, but it's, um, it's not. <clears throat> um, I mean, in, in, a, in a sense it is because it's, it's challenging these same – time period highs, but obviously that bounce was that much shallower um, off the lows in August. And the U.S. market's got a good bounce off the lows in August uh, and then came lower. Uh, the FTSE 100 has basically been in this range, and we had this double fake-out lower, which hasn't materialized in any big losses. And now we're kind of doing the same on the top side, where this was the high. We tried to break out, but just sort of failed so far. And it's, it's, a, it's not triggering a sort of big bounce back as, as this is because obviously on the downside you have short covering so people short the position short the market below this low scramble to get out and uh, anyone short you know anywhere looking for um, looking to re-enter the market short on the bounce uh, cover and that adds to the buying so <clears throat> don't get that quite so much on the upside but nonetheless bit of a fake out higher at the moment we're below the 200-day moving average, and um, the higher we get into this range, the bigger the risk of the, the market rolling over. There's not really a defined trend, and obviously, um, 
in terms of sort of value trading, we're near the topper end of the train, uh, the trading range than the bottom. And you know, it's get, starting to get to the stage where you know sells are a higher probability than than uh, than buys at this point. Uh, we've not made a higher high in the daily chart for a little while. We have on the weekly chart. That's this. But we've made a lower low on the weekly chart too. So not too much of a defined trend, and we're running into this 200-day moving average. So. <clears throat> This is not really looking like a top pattern to me, uh, but nonetheless, it doesn't necessarily have to when we're just in a trading range. Um, you know, this not really a top pattern either. You know, arguably a sort of triangle ready to break out to the top side, but it didn't. You know, you could see something similar here where we chop down and just run out of steam and roll over. Quick look at um, European markets in comparison. Uh, that was just looking at the. We got quite a sharp bounce early, uh, you know, sort of around the time those the, those Chinese remarks were coming out, I believe, and got quite a strong bounce, uh, but really given a lot of those up now. I think with the thin liquidity, no one had the confidence that that move was going to get sustained. We reached 10,100 and just rolled straight back beneath 10,000 again. And so this is um, yeah, it's really interesting in the in the DAX because well here's the breakout from the head and shoulders pattern, but that bearish engulfing pattern that we saw on Thursday, which uh, if I'm not mistaken was the ECB day, um, is um, is basically making making that whole breakout look a bit ominous. And today, if it finished the same way, it would be another fake out higher and um, add scope to the idea that this, this head and shoulders pattern is about to, to break. And if it does, it's, it's a fairly clear cut pattern. I certainly won't be the only one with this on my chart, um, with this you know left shoulder, head, right shoulder. Then um, you know if it breaks, if it, if it drops back below the neckline considerably, particularly below Thursday's low, then I think that's quite a strong signal of weakness in the market. And obviously, bear in mind that we are still below the 200-day moving average. So a lot of reasons to think the market could uh, see significant weakness if this pattern gives way. So definitely keep your eye on 9940-ish, about where we are at the moment um, on the on the Germany 30 as a proxy, not just for German stocks, but for, for the FTSE and for, for US stocks as well. Did mention for anyone new uh, today, obviously feel free to chuck through any questions if you had some. Um, on maybe a market less likely to be covered by me. You know, I'm just going to cover the major FX pairs and co commodities coming up next. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left of the webinar, so definitely feel free to send those my way. If it is something a bit more lengthy, um, always feel free to, to send me a direct private message as well. Um, you know, I can talk to you outside the forum of the, um, the public webinar. <laughs> So one of the reasons that um, that European stocks have been underperforming in the last week or so was obviously um, that kind of failure of the ECB policy to really kick into gear, and then the, um, uh, the the Fed meeting kind of rubbing salt into the wounds because really even though the ECB have doubled down on um, you know their quantitative easing program and um, and and cutting interest rates into the negative. Um, it's not helped weaken the euro because the Fed is looking less likely to, to raise rates at this point. So this euro strength is not really, as I meant, I think I said the exact same line in last week's webinar. It's not because of um, <coughs> strength in the euro. It's just a relative weakness in the dollar that's pushing the euro higher here. So we're back up at, um, you know, these are basically the sort of the um, the, the peak here. You know, it's kind of what's capping us about the sort of 1340. I think it's 137. No, okay, 7580, which is the peak uh, from the 11th of Feb. This 11th of Feb is a big date in a lot of markets. It's called a um, a bottom in stocks, top in gold. Top, I think the gold has surpassed it. Think, I think so. Silver, um, top in. Um, top in the euro, so a bit of a sort of risk asset uh, swing point. So um, when some of these markets brush through here, it, it, it could be meaningful.
The euro is stalled at the moment. So we've got an inside day from Friday. Um, so we'll also have to see that we've got a break to the downside, uh, but it's pulling back in the inside day. I mean, that's fairly typical, to be honest. You shouldn't get too scared um, from an inside day breakout just because it pulls back into the day. You know, obviously, that's a lot of intraday movement. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's not heading lower. But um, should the day close like this or even higher, that would be a bit of a – fake out from an inside day and could be a good sign that the market's going to push back into um, into that peak. So, so look out for that as a little potential um, opportunity to, to at least maybe go and test those uh, those highs just beneath 40, uh, 114. Hmm. Overall, though, a bit like uh, when we were looking at the pound, hard to really pick up a massive uh, – sorry, was it the pound or – no, the, uh, the FTSE um, – this is not really a trending market right now, the euro. So you've got to pick your spots. Um, again, like I said there, the, the, the you know we're reach, we're in a basically a sort of choppy sideways market. Um, so in that kind of environment, selling near peaks, buying near um, troughs tends to be a bit more effective than buying breakouts or selling you know selling breakouts. Um, so just if we pop through this high. My my thinking is that the um, there's a greater likelihood that we roll over, drop down again, than there is that this move can get a continuation higher. Because you know, look at the significant layers of resistance that we have not far above. You know, all those different levels are going to have different sellers looking to sell into the into the strength, particularly with the general fundamental view that you know the ECB is obviously going in the opposite direction to the Fed, even if the Fed slowed down a bit. Uh, we mentioned sterling in terms of today's drivers, but otherwise, it seems like we've put a bit of a bottom in. Um, I'm not sure it's going to dip back through 140 before the referendum. It could do before the referendum, but it would really only be a bit of a sort of Scottish referendum style, I suppose, where the polls start getting really um, really midway and uncertain, closer to the, the date of the referendum. Um, that said, uh, yeah, I think that polls, is, polls are the only things you have to go on before an election. Um, but I think there's been a lot of evidence recently to say the polls, you know, are often very wrong. <laughs> but at the moment, we've made a higher high. We've stalled above that high, and now we're dropping below. Um, similar to the um, the euro, and they were getting a little fake out lower. So we'll have to see whether we can sustain. But to me, this is a this is a pattern of uncertainty, not necessarily bearishness. This um, you know, sort of spinning top, doji type pattern we saw on Friday. Um, but it is just right after a breakout, so you know, not really what you want to see. Yeah, particularly today's action dropping through the low. You know, you want to see that that move continue. But, uh, you know, it looks like we've just run out of steam. And same kind of deal. We've got lots of layers of resistance above here. It's not really an outwardly uptrending market. We're well below the 200-day moving average. So difficult to buy breakouts. You know, if anyone who j jumped in long, right, maybe around uh, 144.60 or something above that high, to me, well, obviously benefit of hindsight, but it's, 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 that's riskier than if you were, like, going for a breakdown below this low. Obviously, that didn't work out. You know, uh, most strategies see um, a good high percentage of uh, missed trades. That's the nature of trading. But to me, that, that would be a higher probability trade looking for the breakdown there than this one would up here because of the nature of the trend that we're in. Mm -hmm. As I said, you know, no coincidence really that that breakout failed and that breakout failed because it's, like I said, in these sideways choppy markets, the breakout trades um, tend to have a, a lower probability than just buying off the, uh, the undervalued or selling the overvalued near, near, near support and resistance. <clears throat> I mean, now that, that, I guess that is more generally the case. You know, if we're getting into a kind of trading dynamics in general, obviously the breakout trades work less often, but when they do work, they work really nicely, um, particularly if you're able to, you know, if you've got a strategy in place to be able to hold on to them, um, you know, sort of trailing stop to right strategy, you know, obviously the many losses are made up for by that big win. It's kind of the nature of the beast. <laughs> Um, quick look at euro again, just versus sterling. 
Um, I've been eyeing out this this uh, this range for a while now. Um, this 0.77 to 0.79 range um, is fairly clear cut, and it's been great for you know selling the top of the range, buying the bottom of the range. At some point, it's got to break out. Not really clear which way. Um, this. Uh, it still looks more like a continuation pattern to me, but could develop into a triple top. That's you know a modest head and shoulders pattern, and um, you know so we've got to you know got to look again for the breakouts here. It could be another fake breakdown, but um, as we said before, you know you get a, a lot of false breaks, but you've got to keep taking them, and eventually one get one goes in your favour, and then you've got to cling on to it as best you can. Dollar yen, similar situation going on where we've um, uh, we've basically put in what could be a triple bottom. Uh, we've had two false breaks below that 111 mark, and uh, haven't been able to get any further. But um, you know, obviously the the trend is very much down. So um, I, I, t I tend to think there is more likelihood of a drop down to 110 than there is a uh, break of this declining trend line. But still, you know, again, when we're talking about a sideways market, the, the higher probability traders buying these supports, selling these resistances rather than looking for the breakout. I think what we could maybe get is, given that we've had two fake outs, I mentioned this in the um, the chart forum, is that we've got a bit of um, bit of potential support turned into resistance maybe from these lows around the one sort of you know one twelve twenty five ish. So if we do get a little bit of rebound to there. Maybe that's an area that the um, the market can roll over again for to actually achieve the breakout. Mm. Um, just had a question about Brexit. <clears throat> I mean, I've got my own opinions on Brexit, but um, for the mo for the for the for the moment, I um, I don't think that um, you know it's, it's weighing on sterling. You know, I think it's uh, every bit of news around Brexit. Uh, Brexit is um, is typically um, important for sterling, but we're not seeing any influence on gilt markets, and we're not seeing really any influence on stocks. I would argue, um, and probably won't until closer to the. Um, uh, until the actual June referendum date. So, yeah, I've obviously got my opinions on whether we're better off in, in Europe or not. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave everyone to make their own decision on that one. <laughs> so, actually, I'm highlighting Brent here, but the WTI, um, obviously, we were lower early on in oil. Um, Basically, this 40 level in WTI is, is causing a bit of problems. We had a, a drop on Friday. That was the first drop after two nice days of gains. And it's, you can see that the market's working quite orderly in oil. Um, you know, benefit of hindsight, obviously, and, you know, you get a few little false breaks and things. But nonetheless, reasonable stop losses, e even um, selling what has been a very strong move higher, you're getting some little dips at where you'd expect the dips to come from. Um, and so, obviously, we're at the 40 mark here. Um, you know, a nice trade, if it were, if you were to have the opportunity, I think would be maybe another drop down to this 37.50, um, uh, and then eyeing 40 and, and 43 again. Um, that would be in line with the trend, and so um, have a higher probability than if we try and sell this 43. Uh, sorry, this 40 level on rebound. Um, but then again, 43 again was significant support for a while. So if we get up to there, I think that could be some uh, some resistance again. You know, just below it, we have these two peaks. Um, but I, um, you know, we haven't got there yet. 40 is a big round number, and um, on Friday we saw U.S. rigs um, have their first increase uh, this year. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the pattern that we're going to see in markets, you know, in oil, sorry, for a while, I think, is that, um, the, you know, these U.S. shale producers are very quick to get back online and start pumping oil again. And so once we get a bump, a rise in the oil price, uh, suddenly U.S. supply, supply starts increasing again and uh, drives the price back down. So until we see other sources of supply, normally, namely OPEC and other kind of long-term 
deep water projects coming offline, you know, we're going to get this short-term effect of higher price, higher supply for much from shale, lower price, lower output from shale, back and forth. Um, gold has lost a bit of its luster over the last few days, I mean, largely down to um, the dollar dollar weakness that we've, sorry, dollar, a little bit of dollar strength that we've been seeing, and this channel, you know, this channel's kind of working. Um, uh, we haven't had a chance to go up and test the 1300 mark um, yet, and it looks like, to me, at this point, I mean, it's a consolidation, so, you know, <clears throat> There's some pretty large tails, both from the top and the downside. Hard to really tell which way it's going to go. With the, with the short-term trend, favors a break higher. Below the 200-week moving average, um, below 1,300, favors a break lower. So um, difficult to difficult to call at the moment. Um, you know, sort of feel like it's due a big correction, but that's not to say it can't have another little pop first. My my, my assumption. I, I would say I'd probably default towards um, if we do get a move up to 1300, then is the higher probability area for a for a deeper sell-off. Uh, just going to quickly touch on copper because we've got a, a um, an interesting pattern here. Um, we know we tried to take out the the previous peak for March. Uh, failed to do so, and uh, put in a shooting star reversal. So if we get a, a close below there, especially, that's quite a bearish signal, um, especially as we just made it above the 200-day moving average. Um, not really confirmed at the moment. We'll have to see how today closes. But if today's close is lower, or even if just um, today's peak is lower than the Friday's, we're going to have a bit of bearish divergence, you know, a higher high and a lower low, reversal candlestick pattern, a few things to point towards a, uh, a correction there in silver, perhaps down to 220 again, um, perhaps lower. <laughs> Okay, uh, that's it for this week's webinar. Uh, we've pretty much got a couple of minutes left. Um, thank you very much all for attending. Hope it was helpful. Uh, good luck with trading this week. Um, didn't really cover too many of the major uh, economic um, announcements that are coming up, really because there isn't many. Um, you know, we do have uh, uh, U.S. durable goods. Probably the uh, the biggest one tomorrow is quite big because we've got the Eurozone um, PMIs, uh, both German, major German business and investor confidence surveys out, and um, UK inflation data uh, all out tomorrow. Um, and then we have UK retail sales on Thursday. Um, that's the same day as the durable goods, and then and then just nothing on Friday for the bank holiday. So. Um, Probably not going to be economic data necessarily driving things, hence not the big influence in the webinar today. You know, watch out for the direction of the U.S. dollar. Um, we do have the Fed and ECB speakers trying to influence things, so watch out for that. Thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a happy Easter. Cheers.